Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lucia Alais. I am an architectural historian, and I'm the director of the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia University. Welcome to the first in our series of um, conversations on architecture and land in the Americas with Joseph Conkel and Teresa Montoya. There'll be two more such events this spring, and check the chat for those dates. Um, I'm uh, going to share my screen real quick. I'm joining you today from uh, a campus in Morningside Heights on an island that lies within the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. Until about 1650, the Lenape managed the forests, marshes, animals, winds, floods, and paths in this place by stopping by as they navigated what is now the Hudson River, seasonally staying in small encampments, growing food, perhaps also harvesting crops, hunting and fishing some animal species while leaving others alone, periodically setting fires to control growth, and generally maintaining a resource ecology that stretched all along the Atlantic coast, from what is now Western Connecticut to Delaware, including most of New Jersey and Southern New York. By the end of the 17th century, the Lenape had been largely driven out of their homelands, and in the following centuries, their numbers have been decimated, their humanity denied, and their descendants dispersed. The European settler state that was responsible for this erasure and this diaspora relied overwhelmingly on the institutionalization of land. Columbia University, a land-based institution, is a legacy of this urge to settle. And in fact, the building in which I sit today embodies architecture's imbrication with this institutional urge in a particularly vivid way. The Buell Center, which you see here in red, is a relatively young institution, 40 years old, but it gives its name to a red brick building that is the oldest on this campus. The building preceded the campus. It was already there in 1896 when Columbia University purchased this land and received special status as a not-for-profit organization. The building had been built in 1885 for an earlier institution a special ward to host the wealthier male mental patients at the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum that had existed on the sites since the 1830s. So central was architecture to the construction of institutional legitimacy that not only did Columbia decide to keep this building when it took over the land, but as the campus expanded, the building was preserved and moved 42 feet vertically and 97 feet north rather than being destroyed as part of a new expansion plan. In other words, since at least the 19th century, maintaining this large of a piece of land in a city in the United States requires a special arrangement, an institution. And while some institutional legacies demand an honorific architecture, the kind of architecture that is sustained in carefully preserved red bricks, other institutional legacies are less tangible architecturally. For example, as this building was being constructed, the 1897 General Allotment Act was passed to break up the large reservations of land into which indigenous communities had been gathered since the 1830s after fleeing persecution. The Lenape people, for example, were found in Oklahoma and in Texas. This act also had profound architectural consequences, shrinking the land base of surviving indigenous people and compelling them to adopt Western institutions, such as that of private property or family farming. I'm recounting this history today, not only to acknowledge the role that our hosting institutions have played in the erasure of indigenous people's relationships to their homelands, but also because the relationship between architecture and land in the Americas is our topic and takes the form of a question, an open question. How do we tell a non-objectivizing history of land? How do we account for the insight on the part of indigenous scholars and activists and practitioners that land isn't an object, but a relationship? Our two guests today are experts about and participants in these institutional architectures as they're lived and experienced by indigenous communities. So the title of our event is On Trust Land, and I'll just explain this choice briefly. It's meant to be specific to the predicament of indigenous communities, but also instructive and comparative for many different kinds of trusts that exist. As an institution specific to indigenous nations in the United States, trust land was invented in 1934 when the federal government decided this time that indigenous people should be able to buy back land 
but again with very specific spatial and social architecture, as long as they registered in a national database, performed gestures of privatization, such as enclosing land, and accepted a generally paternalistic form of governance, where land was placed in what was called the trust to avoid claims of outright ownership or of sovereignty. The use of the phrase trust land to designate this institution may seem especially confounding to an architectural audience, as these two words, land and trust, are also used today to name relatively commonplace legal tools that are increasingly used alongside design to produce the built environment. Community land trusts, for example, used to develop housing, conservation land trusts used to keep the built environment from sprawling into nature preserves, and there are also state trusts instituted at the end of the 18th century to manage public lands. However different all of these cases are, they have one thing in common, that a trust is understood as an object, a thing, a financial construct, like this box in our diagram. In the case of indigenous rights, many of the transactions are actually the same, but the word trust continues to designate something that is both a thing and a political relationship. In fact, in 1983, the relationship between the US government and indigenous nations was explicitly named as such. And so today we host two speakers who are rethinking how trust lands are inhabited and struggled for. Their knowledge and their practices help insert trust land into patterns of the past and future developments. And I would just point into two ways. First, the history of indigenous dispossession is a history of transactions. And as we will hear from Joseph Kunkel, indigenous communities in some sense have no choice but to engage in this transactionality for even the most basic architectural program, such as that of building housing. And second, dispossession is not a past event, but an ongoing one. And as we will hear from Teresa Montoya, its pro most prominent medium is infrastructure. Resource extraction, like allotment acts and reorganization acts, are infrastructural acts that can provoke the mobility of certain people while giving others the privilege of permanence. After all, and this will be my last acknowledgement, we're meeting today remotely. This remoteness is uh, made possible by hardware and software that we consume, that consume an immense amount of energy. This energy is being supplied to each of us somehow extract it from land somewhere on the earth, somewhere that we are not. And the two cultural producers we welcome today can help us think about this kind of relationship, new ways that land is experienced as relationship, not only in indigenous communities, but all over the earth. So our event today takes the form of two presentations. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, followed by um, discussion, hopefully among our speakers, and, um, and then followed by a Q&A. So, um, Joseph has, has kindly turned on his camera and I'll introduce him first. Joseph Kanko is a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and a principal at Mass Design Group, where he directs the Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's a community designer and educator focused on sustainable development practices throughout Indian country. His work include exemplary American Indian housing projects and processes nationwide. And this research work has developed into emerging best practices, leading to the publication of a guide, an online guide called Healthy Homes Roadmap for Tribal Housing Development, which is funded by the HUD. Um, in 2019, Joseph was awarded an Obama Foundation Fellowship for his work with Indigenous communities. Uh, Joseph is a fellow of the inaugural class of the Civil Society Fellowship, a partnership of ADL and the Aspen Institute. He's a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And most recently, uh, congratulations on this, Joseph was named a 2022 Rubinger Community Fellow by the Local Initiative Support Corporation. So please um, help me um, welcome Joseph. And Joseph, go ahead and share your screen. Thank you. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. I have this ready. Uh, so uh, there we are. So. Thank you, thank you all for being here this morning. Kind of wanted to start the discussion with this conversation around community culture and place, how this is kind of all kind of coming together and its relationship to land and, and, and posing uh, this question. I'm um, gonna kind of go through this quickly, but this, um, this idea around questions that help frame our conversations today. 
uh, questions that really kind of lift up where we are um, in kind of space and time as it relates to the communities that we serve uh, out of the Santa Fe office and at Mass at large, but really kind of talking about this dichotomy between this, uh, which is this, this tension between the rural and urban, right? And there's kind of four images here, um, uh, Manhattan Island, uh, what is now uh, the capital of what is now the United States and these two kind of rural spaces. Uh, and lifting up that this is Indian country, right? We kind of heard, uh, Lucia, you kind of shared, this is the uh, home, uh, homelands of the Lene Lenape. Um, it, it's th these rural places are, as kind of we coined it, Indian country. Um, it's where we celebrate our cultures. It's where, our, it's our connection to place. It's the connection to our families, our ancestors, our, our kind of cultural activities. Um, this is the, this is the Tongue River, uh, my homelands in, in what is now southeastern Montana. These are literally uh, my family's allotted lands on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is also Indian country, right? Uh, this is uh, on the Navajo Nation. Uh, uh, it, it's housing that doesn't necessarily represent a community's sense of culture, sense of place, uh, sense of identity. Uh, and so the architecture isn't kind of uh, doing the land any justice it's this, this kind of disconnection from from place um the manhattan island right the, this is like the financial capital of the world yet uh it, this kind of notion around kind of indigenous culture or uh indigenous kind of connection to place isn't necessarily at uh kind of being spoken in in or is out there kind of much more broadly yet uh, when we think about the mohawk iron workers that built these structures uh many of these structures there's a that there's a disconnect there right the home of the piscataway uh the the nation's capital yet they are not necessarily a federally recognized tribe and so what is this connection between state recognized self-identifying and federally recognized tribal tribal communities and this is Indian country where I'm joining you all uh, from today, right? Uh, and I, I want to kind of acknowledge with gratitude the Oge Poge, the original Tewa name uh, for Santa Fe, which means white shell water place on whose unceded traditional territories this office is based. Uh, we honor these people past, present, and future, along with the many other indigenous peoples who inhabited, continue to habit, hold sacred, and steward these lands. Um, these are kind of native lands. Uh, and to kind of lift that up is to kind of lift up a history. Um, it's, it's these indigenous lands. Uh, it's this connection to place. Uh, like I said, history. Um, uh, prior to Western contact, it's, it's estimated that there were 20 million indigenous peoples that called this, this, these, these lands home. Uh, and, and today we're approximately 5.4, 6.4. And according to an NPR uh, stories, those that self-identify in the most current census, that number is, is, is rising dramatically. Uh, there are 574 federally recognized tribes uh, in this country uh, and not all have uh, tribal trust lands to be clear. It's just over uh, 350 uh, tribal reservations in, in, in the country. So what does it mean to have a, a physical connection to place? What does it mean to have a physical connection to the culture, to, to uh, kind of, uh, to, to the kind of built environment and, uh, and, and trying to kind of lift up, what does that mean when it comes to healing, when it comes to identity, when it comes to community, family, and, and how we work. Uh, that's all kind of, all these kind of semblance and these connections to how we think about the power of place and the power of architecture. Uh, like I said, this is, these are my homelands. It's, it's kind of my first notions of what I, I thought the built environment was doing or not doing uh, for, for, for my community, for our people. Um, so why are we here? I kind of pose that question. Why are you all here? Uh, and and why, why am I here? And, and kind of lifting up this this notion that architecture is never neutral it either heals or hurts and to kind of broaden our mission our mission is to research build and advocate for uh, an architecture for a design that promotes uh, justice and human dignity and 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 historically when we think about the built environment when we think about that connection to place uh, the architecture hasn't done that and so how do we reframe that 33% uh, of Indian country lives in poverty versus the national average of 12.5%. Uh, on any given day, 90,000 are homeless. There's an immediate need of 200,000 units of housing on these kind of lands. Yet, when we think about uh, uh, the ways in which we access funding and we access financing on tribal lands, it's not necessarily equitable. 
right? Uh, if we were to just solely rely on the federal resources and, and the kind of current financial uh, mechanisms that we have to build on tribal lands, it would take about 120 years to build uh, 200,000 units of, ha of housing. And so we need to kind of rethink those structures um, uh, uh, when we think about philanthropy, 0.03% point, um, uh, of, of philanthropy goes to native led organizations when Indian country uh, makes up uh, just over 1% of, of the US population. Because uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't kind of innovate, if we don't rethink these systems, this is the kind of architecture that will inevitably get an architecture that doesn't reflect uh, the community, the culture, and the places of, of our, of our uh, indigenous populations. Um, and so posing the question, the question is not, and, and as many of you, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the question first and then I'll acknowledge uh, the individual. Uh, the, the question is not what is the cost of architecture, but what is the cost of not having architecture? And, one of our early collaborators, Paul Farmer, who recently passed this earlier this week, um, kind of posed that question. How do we think about our built environments and what is that connection to place? What is that connection to, to the lands in which we're building? Um, and so our team is really looking at these kind of three areas, researching, building, and advocating for ways in which we're uh, thinking about the built environment. Because if we don't, uh, our, our the, the communities that we're serving uh, will will kind of result in this notion of placelessness, and we really want to be honoring the lands, honoring the built environments in which we're we're looking at. And so, I wanted to kind of dive in quickly to a case study, to a project that I worked on early on in my my career uh, with the Santo Domingo Pueblo, or also known as the Kiwa Pueblo, which is located about. Uh, 30 minutes south of where I'm located today, um, uh, in between Santa Fe, New Mexico, and, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's a rural community along the Rio Grande, right? And, and my, my focus was trying to kind of understand what is the power of design? How can we think about the built environment? And how can we leverage the built environment to lift up this notion around culture, community, and place? And early on in the process, how can we leverage design and, and really think about it as an opportunity for change. Uh, and we knew that we had early on in the planning process an opportunity to flex that design muscle because as a project gets further and further into uh, the development process, our ability as designers to advocate for what design can do is is, is slowly diminishing as, as a project become, comes, uh, becomes uh, further and further into um, uh, fruition, right? And, and our process started working right there on the ground, on the lands of the, of the, of the Kiwa Pueblo, working with tribal youth, um, leveraging the skill sets that I had as a, as a designer, as a planner, uh, someone who was practicing architecture in, in this community and wanted to lift up that I was an outsider, right? I might be a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation, but I'm not a citizen uh, of this community. And so how were we kind of bringing together the kind of cultural nuances that these young individuals understood and knew uh, while merging that with kind of the design knowledge and skill sets uh, that I brought and how do we kind of bring that together? Uh, and so we walked the community, we learned about the community uh, and, and tried to understand in what ways could we leverage a design process to lift up their voices and lift up ways in which they could be communicating these, these complex ideas uh, more locally, right? And, and teaching kind of hard and soft skills, right? They were getting to kind of understand the different um, uh, softwares and, and, and design uh, tools that allow them to understand their communities differently uh, and, and merging these kind of Western ideologies with uh, these indigenous uh, uh, knowledges. Um, and so we walked the community, uh, we surveyed the, the historic village. Um, we were in some ways becoming more proactive rather than reactive. Uh, when there was an issue in the, in the community village, uh, in the in the historic village, community members would go to the housing authority and ask for support. Right, uh, my roof is leaking, my window's broken, my refrigerator doesn't work, my heating is off, and so that was a very reactive response. Whereas, if we were able to kind of survey and understand the conditions of every one of the units within the community, then the housing authority could proactively move forward. Uh, and so, this is a way of merging kind of the traditional architectural practice. With, uh, with a way of serving the community and, and lifting up their, their, their ways of, of being. Um, this image here, uh, which really kind of speaks to uh, 
uh, this, this inability for Western society to kind of identify the cultural nuances of a community, right? That blue boundary box is a national historic boundary uh, of sin. It's a kind of basically the National Park Services says everything in that blue box is, is historic, right? And, and you see this all over the Pueblos uh, in, in New Mexico that this random box is placed, right? And in that bottom right, that blue line goes through a house, right? And so what does that mean? One, one side of the house is historic and the other is not. Well, during the surveying process, uh, kind of walking through the community, kind of understanding these particular lands, we were able to kind of establish what the community deemed as historic rather than the, the, the federal government. And so this kind of tension between uh, a government to government relationship was important to be lifting up. Uh, and we did that through historic imagery. We tried to kind of understand the development of the Pueblo over time. And so again, taking kind of Western ways of practicing and merging them with the, uh, the community's ways of, uh, of being. Um, and then just very quickly going into under, understanding what were the conditions of these units? Uh, how could we start to leverage the Indian Housing Block Grant, the Indian Community Development Block Grant? Uh, the federal funds uh, allocated through the Native American Self-Determination Assistance and Housing Act, or, or NAHASDA uh, for short, which was passed in 1995, trying to kind of find ways of leveraging those funds and ensuring that the communities were in control, or in, in this case, Santa Domingo was in, in control of, of allocating those funds, how they deemed, uh, deemed it uh, important. And so when we were reflecting back, we were very much creating these networks of partnerships, right? We were trying to connect practice with the government, with kind of the academy uh, and with philanthropy. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment, but really trying to understand how are we sharing the, these kind of sets of knowledges, uh, scaling the outcomes and creating some semblance of community impact. Um, and so this, this idea of, uh, of being there, being present, uh, being on the ground, knowing the populations, knowing the audience was incredibly important for us to do the work. Uh, and then aligning that with the funding potentials, right? Uh, where are we garnering funding? Uh, we can come up with all the good ideas that we want, but if we can't actually execute them, then we're kind of caught in this kind of idea of advocating, but not necessarily building. And so through this work, developing a set of principles and goals, community as architect of their own vision, right? This kind of vision as a long-term commitment to change, engaging with the community to gain a clarity and understanding of perspective of place, and then participation from everyone, right? So how are we asking these questions to tribal youth all the way through tribal elders uh, and understanding what is their understanding of, of the built environment? Um, and so this notion of designing with and not for community helps to kind of lift up this uh, idea around creating equitable uh, equity and positive social change. Uh, and this allows us to define what's possible, right? It defines a, a process that really lifts up kind of a, a, a Santa Domingo perspective around the built environment, a Giwa per perspective of, of the built environment and not uh, if I were to kind of cone it, it's not my perspective, right? Uh, it's not an outside perspective. It's really building that from within. Uh, it's leveraging the past, right? This is this is the this is the village. This is the historic village, which kind of resembles a density of an urban place, an urban space. Uh, and thinking about how that relates to the future, right? How can we take that and reflect, not copy paste? but really build on this notion of, of how do we learn from the past and leverage that for a future architecture that is, is kind of uh, identifying of this, of this place, of these lands. And, and it is about that kind of listening to the community, right? We started to learn that 75% of the community members uh, re relied on the, on the arts as a main source of income, right? This is Robert Tenario, he's a potter. Uh, and so if we're thinking about housing, if we're thinking about ways of building on these lands, we need to also be thinking about uh, how they're going to be using these spaces, right? Uh, we came up with a model, a typology that uh, had a art studio or a maker space uh, attached or adjacent to every one of the structures. Initially, we were thinking about 60 units after doing all the financial work we started to realize that uh, it was uh, it turned out to be 41 units. Um, and, and as you can kind of see in this kind of site plan, there's a rail, the, there are railroad tracks to the north. Uh, that rail, railroad line connects Santa Domingo to Santa Fe to Albuquerque. It's the rail runner, which allows them to access the art markets, to access 
uh, healthcare, education, get, get to UNM, uh, University of New Mexico. And so trying to find ways of using that public infrastructure to connect the community. Uh, that about bottom right unit uh, is about a five minute walk to the rail runner station, right? That, that notion of how are we building infrastructure, building on infrastructure that may be in urban spaces we take for granted. And so trying to kind of understand the complexities that we can be kind of lifting up within, within a rural context. And these are just some really quick images uh, of, of how we were thinking um, about thinking about an architecture that would be reflecting the this sense of community, this sense of place, uh, and understanding ways of which uh, we were um, lifting up the Santa Domingo priorities, uh, or Santa Domingo's priorities, rather than um, uh, just building housing, right? There's a, there's a very specific connection there. A, a community center that kind of dubbed as a uh, a multi-purpose space, a community kitchen, a child daycare, a training center, um, a, a place to build up and, and maybe even host uh, gatherings, uh, host ways of thinking. And of course, those little shed shed areas are making spaces. Here we have one of the community members making hishi uh, while, while his son kind of looks in. But this notion of you're building up and building that capacity locally. And so the kind of question that I'll, I'll leave you all with is this, like thinking about what is that connection to place and, and why are you here and, and, and what ways in which we're thinking about uh, what we're doing and, and why, why, uh, why am I here? I'm just kind of thinking about that next generation, right? Uh, inevitably, if we're thinking about the architecture, if we're thinking about the lands in which we're building on, we're thinking generations ahead in terms of how they're going to sustain our, our tribal uh, youth and, and future generations are going to sustain these lands and kind of sustain the places in which we're living, right? They're the future. They're our future leaders of, of, of the communities in which we're serving. So if we're not doing anything uh, uh, sustainable in the, in the kind of contemporary sense, then we're not really building a future for them. So I'll just leave it there uh, and, and pass it back. So thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, and I'll go straight uh, to introducing our second speaker, Teresa Montoya. Um, Teresa Montoya is a social scientist, a media maker and educator. Uh, Montoya's research and media production focuses on legacies of environmental contamination in relation to contemporary issues of tribal jurisdiction, regulatory politics, water security, and public health on the Navajo Nation. Her research has been published in Cultural Anthropology and Water International, in the American Journal of Public Health and the Journal of the Anthropology of North America. Her photographic and film work has been shown internationally, most recently in an exhibition entitled Spill in Vancouver, BC. In addition to her art practice, she has curatorial and education experience at various institutions, including the Peabody Essex Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, and currently the Field Museum. She is a provost, postdoctoral fellow, and incoming assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. She is Dine and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Teresa Montoya. Take it away. Uh, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Joseph for laying some of the groundwork for our discussion today. Um, so I'm going to share um, presentation and also go very quickly over some preliminary concepts that I think um, will help guide our larger conversation. Okay. Um, so when I was invited to be part of this conversation, you know, um, I was thinking on this notion of, of trust land and this larger question of what does it mean to own land? Um, so starting from this orientation, um, I further asked, you know, how do we decenter these naturalized notions of property ownership, notions that presume um, settler occupation and seizure of indigenous land that was somehow inevitable, rational, or morally legitimate, uh, so briefly, I will outline a few concepts of land and property uh, that will help orient this discussion. 
Um, so in addition to the um, earlier introduction, um, I'm gonna show a couple of these uh, animations that illustrate the rapid theft of indigenous land and territory. There's also this land map. So at once, this illustrates a process of what could be termed land acquisition or land loss. Uh, the notion of acquisition from the US settler state um, was an imperative of settler colonialism of westward expansion. Um, this was fulfilled through multiple um, acts of violence, assaults and tactics, but also in legislation. Um, and this notion of private property ownership um, through settlement itself. And of course, the other orientation, which is of land loss and dispossession of territory, um, which this, those animations violently illustrate, uh, is a, an indigenous perspective that hasn't been centered in US policy. So contemporary notions of Western property law are legitimized through ideas of righteous ownership. So how can we unpack what ownership means and for whom it serves? Uh, so really briefly, I want to, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, point to uh, an English philosopher named John Locke. Um, I teach this a lot in my classes, which seems um, you know, to be going back several centuries. Um, you know, people wonder, like, what is the connection between um, an English philosopher um, you know, who wrote the Second Treatise of Government and land ownership today? Um, he's called the so-called so father of liberalism. Um, and what he, what he proposed is that um, land ownership or the right of ownership is determined through labor upon land. So if you work the land, um, that you have some inherent right to this thing. And that notion I think is really central to uh, a settler colonial view of land possession in the US today. It undergirds basically all of um, land tenure system. Um, and several indigenous um, scholars have also you know, criticized um, these sorts of views and how it's informed um, indigenous land theft as moral, rational, and legitimate. Um, here's a quick quote from Vine Deloria Jr. Um, who states, one day the white man discovered that the Indian tribes owned some 135 million acres of land. To his horror, we learned much of it was very valuable. Therefore, it took no time at all to discover that Indians were really people and should have the right to sell their lands. Land was the means of recognizing Indian as a human being. It was a method whereby land could be stolen legally and not blatantly. Discovery negated the rights of Indian tribes to sovereignty and equality among the nations of the world. It took away the title to their land and gave them the right only to sell. So in this quote, I want to point to a couple of things. First, um, you know, that the recognition of, of, of the humanity of um, indigenous people, um, something that was, um, you know, heretofore not recognized, um, this was required in order to, to establish a relationship whereby land could be taken, right? If you could recognize that, oh, yes, um, this indigenous person is a, is a landowner, therefore they, um, they could enter into a property transaction. So that recognition was only in the moment of property theft. Um, and this very last line, it took away their title to their land and gave them the right only to sell. So this is in summary, the, the notion of um, allotment, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, whereby uh, indigenous land was broken up into parcels, you know, the um, imperative of divide and conquer um, under this idea of uplift, right? Of, of bringing native people um, into uh, these ideas of, of civilization. Um, and it was through this notion of property ownership 
Um, so with allotment policies of 1887, um, it designated um, you know, each, each head of family to um, 160 acres of land. Um, they had to be registered through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So this brought in this process of uh, federal recognition, right? And um, the disastrous policies of blood quantum, which still continue to um, affect many of our communities today. Um, so it legitimized the system of the federal government determining who was Indian and who was not. Um, and it, it also, um, you know, it was premised on this idea that eventually um, indigenous land would cease to exist, right? So that the further breaking up of parcels of land um, is akin to the notion that indigenous peoples themselves would cease to exist, that eventually um, our ancestors would continue to intermix um, with the rest of the population. So there was this, this diminishment of our communities and our nationhood, both in our bloodlines, but also through our land. And this was a, um, a, a conscious um, decision and policy enacted by the federal government. So in light of all of this, what does trust mean? Where Walter Echo Hawk um, states, by 1881, Indian land holdings in the US had plummeted 150, 60 million, or 56 million acres. By 1934, only about 50 million acres remained. As a result of the General Allotment Act of 1887, during World War II, the government took 500,000 more acres for military use. Uh, for over 100 tribes, um, bands and rancherias relinquished their lands under various acts of Congress during the termination era of the 1950s. So this is a primer now, we're jumping to this, um, to this era in the 20th century, um, in allotment was determined to be a failure. And, um, and so the, the US government uh, then shifted to what is called the determination era, um, relocation era. So many um, indigenous uh, tribal members, you know, moved in droves to the cities. This was, you know, another policy of trying to bring indigenous people into the fold of mainstream America um, and to disconnect us from our land and territories. So today, when you look, when you think about um, trust and trust lands, federal lands, this, um, you know, this map here is illustrating all the different types of land that is held in trust by the US federal government. Um, the, red, the red is indicating uh, tribal lands. Um, so built on these earlier notions of wardship, of indigenous people being so-called wards of the state, um, not being able to own or um, to own their land outright, only being given the um, right to sell their land. Um, you know, how, how do we make sense of what um, Joseph has said, like healing in light of this? So in my research, um, as an anthropologist, I tried to connect these colonial land policies of um, uh, earlier centuries with environmental contamination today. How can tribes um, work within this complicated system of um, land tenure that has continually over the centuries sought to dispossess us of our land, of our sovereignty, our jurisdiction? And what are the ways that tribes can actually enact um, policies um, for their own benefit. So the broader Colorado Plateau region um, across the four corner states, um, you can see here this outline on this map um, is the Navajo Nation and there are over 500 abandoned uranium mines. And this is a consequence of rampant resource extraction across the region from the 1940s through um, the 1970s into 80s um, as part of larger Cold War efforts. It's an area that's very rich in uranium and vanadium resources. And even though the Navajo Nation has passed legislation since 2005 to ban um, uranium mining on the Navajo Nation, the legacy of these, um, these assaults still remains in the form of groundwater contamination. This area was also um, the site of multiple uh, nuclear testing, both in Nevada and the state of New Mexico. Um, so this whole region has been designated a quote unquote downwinder region. So people, you know, um, over time inhaling 
um, radioactive contaminants into their lungs. And so you see the successive layering of um, environmental contamination. Um, and so in this map, I also want to point out, um, so the Church Rock spill of 1979 uh, was the largest nuclear release in US history. Most people don't know about it. It was the same year as the Three Mile Island incident, which is much more widely publicized. Um, but the Church Rock spill, because it wasn't a nuclear meltdown, it was a uranium mill tailing spill. Um, it sent contaminants um, downstream um, into all of these other Diné communities, including um, the community where my maternal grandparents are from, which is in this uh, region, both on and off the reservation, um, near Wide Ruins and this community of Sanders. So my research you know, centers on these community impacts. How do people strategically navigate between um, these uh, multiple jurisdictions um, and try to understand how can we actually get clean water? Um, this is just another uh, image here of a Department of Energy site, a former Kermagee um, uran uranium mill tailing site in Shiprock, New Mexico. So this also shows um, or illustrates how pervasive um, uranium and hard rock mining was across the region and continues um, you know, to pose threats to human health as the sign illustrates in both English and Dene Bazad, Navajo language. Um, and this is similar to another map that uh, Lucia had put up earlier, but um, following um, a policy of forced relocation in the 1860s, um, where our Diné ancestors were forcibly um, marched to a military reservation in central New Mexico. Um, and this was also at the same time as the Civil War. Um, so the US was otherwise occupied with many other things. So at the end of um, 1868, um, many of our ancestors, the ones who had survived, were allowed to return to our homelands. Um, and that's when this uh, reservation of 1868 was established. You see this in this purple rectangle here. This is a, a diminishment of our original territories, which extended into Colorado, um, you know, to the Rio Grande in New Mexico and all across what is now considered Northern Arizona and into Southern Utah. Um, and as a consequence of this, um, this forced removal, the US also simultaneously was enacting transcontinental railroad um, policies. Um, so this is part of this you know, broader push of Western expansion. Um, here's a, a railroad map here um, to establish the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad that went across, directly across Pueblo and um, Diné territory. And this image here, uh, taken from the Library of Congress, I think shows actually the extent to which um, this theft continues to impact um, land tenure today. I'm trying to make it, oops. It wasn't able to animate. Um, there we go. Um, the checkerboard allotment system, um, similar to the Dawes allotment system, um, essentially gave away by the federal government discontinuous allotments of land um, for the encouragement of settlement. So rather than the US government uh, federally funding the Transcontinental Railroad, they said, okay, all of these private railroad companies will receive these land tracts, which they in turn will sell to settlers. Um, so they gave away, effectively gave away this land while Navajo people were interned at Fort Sumner. Um, and this, uh, this corridor, um, you know, uh, when Navajo people returned, you know, it led to these um, violent confrontations between uh, settlers and Diné and Hopi who had been living in this region for time immemorial. And as uh, the Navajo nation was able to successfully um, recover some of their land, it did, it, um, these land parcels of, of settler ownership still remained. And so these are the vestiges of settler colonialism from the 19th century and the 20th century um, that continue to pose um, serious threats and challenges to the exercise of Navajo sovereignty. Um, and for you know, my family that lives in this, um, this borderland region, 
on a parcel, um, a territory that is three square acres or three square miles, um, but is completely occupied by Dainé people. But because of this railroad allotment system, it is not considered to be the contemporary jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation. So things like trying to remediate um, uranium cleanup from the 1979 Church Rock spill um, are hindered because of this island jurisdiction. And um, this is a problem all across Indian countries, this notion of checkerboarding, uh, fractionalized land interests that um, you know, have enabled um, other sorts of business ventures that would otherwise be illegal on our tribal territory. Um, so I think this puts into you know, stark relief like the contemporary impacts of the settler colonial land policy um, for the exercise of Diné sovereignty today. Um, these images here point to you know, the, the, the um, physical vestiges of um, railroad and settler infrastructure that continue to contaminate um, our homelands. Um, these images are from the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, which was the site of the 2015 Gold King Mines Bill. Um, so some of my photographic um, and art practice um, you know, centers on this uh, tracing the path of this spill. So um, in 2017, I completed a, a photo essay um, titled To Kletso, which uh, in Diné language means yellow water. Um, and that at once references, um, you know, the legacy of uranium, yellow cake, um, but also these other forms of contamination. Um, and even though these, um, these hard rock mines uh, were built in Colorado, um, you know, away from um, our, our homelands, we continue to feel those impacts through the flow of contaminants um, south onto our homelands. And this is an image um, by David Burney called Contamination, which is also uh, was made in commemoration of the Gold King mine spill. Um, and so just briefly, I just, I want to um, now point to you know, what are indigenous relationships to land? How can we um, heal and you know, work together to, um, to confront this legacy of contamination and um, uh, land theft? Um, so a lot of my work is um, you know, working side along, alongside indigenous communities that are trying to um, understand um, this legacy of contamination. So um, this is just an example of different sorts of art that um, grassroots um, groups have made to warn people about um, the presence of uranium contaminants. Um, the Navajo Nation, um, you know, on a, on a note of infrastructure, 40% uh, of families still don't have running water. Um, and this is in a region, which I said, um, is very rich in so-called resources, you know, not only uranium, but also coal. Um, so coal has been extracted um, over the past century in order to fuel energy production in the broader Southwest. So to provide energy to cities like Phoenix and Los Angeles. So it's required, you know, the extraction of coal from our territory, but also water. Um, and at the same time, many of our own communities don't even have running water. Um, so many people rely on um, these livestock wells um, will haul water, sometimes driving um, you know, one or two hours um, just to provide um, running water for, for their families. Um, so this is part of you know, the, um, the longstanding legacy of um, you know, this, this, this fractionalization, um, the divide and conquer tactics of the US settler state. Um, and despite all that, you know, um, indigenous people have continued to, to survive and thrive. Um, this was after the Gold King Mine spill, um, where, you know, community came together. This is like steam, steamed corn in the ground um, in a community of ship rock. Um, so I think the challenge is in a lot of, of my work is to like hold these two things together. And I think that's a challenge uh, for a lot of us is in doing this work um, is recognizing, you know, the impact of these violent um, policies of erasure, but at the same time pointing to the ways that indigenous communities are working um, 
through these and refusing in certain ways um, the policies that 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 imagined that we would no longer exist. Um, so I think I'll just end it here for now, um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about the, the nitty gritty uh, bureaucratic and regulatory politics. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank you. That was extremely, the question of how one holds two things together, I'm extremely sort of in awe of the multiple registers that both you, um, you Joseph and you Teresa are having to inhabit both critically the multiple registers at which sort of history of violence is deployed tactically, strategically, philosophically um, by, the, by the settler state. And at the same time, the multiple registers that both of you also have to occupy. Um, you know, Joseph, both uh, your practice, both leading you to ask the most fundamental question, which I probably think most architects I know never ask themselves, why am I here? Um, at the same time as you're clearly leveraging these altogether completely imperfect tools that are made available for, for governance because people need to live and need, people need to have housing. And, and Teresa, the, um, I love that you brought us John Locke, not because I love John Locke, but that its relevance can be seen in a continuum with these practices uh, where where it's not only toiling the land, but it's somehow you know, drawing upon a water cistern that is what makes possible you know, the, the continued uh, life of these reservations on the land. So I want to put you both into conversation. I, I have questions, of course, that I could ask each of you, um, but I, I also don't want to be sort of uh, necessarily directing. So I don't know if, you, if either one of you go, want to go ahead. As I said, I have tons of questions up my sleeve and, and sort of um, I'm especially interested to have at some point, I mean, more technicality for sure, uh, but uh, to have Joseph explain to us a little bit how, what dealing with HUD looks like from, from you know, how you work and, and Teresa, how image making and, and uh, visibility making, you know, works within these kinds of practices too. But I'll let you maybe start a conversation if that's okay. Sure. Thank you so much. For sure. sure. Um, uh, go first. <laughs> go, feel free. Feel free. I'm happy to jump in too. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for that presentation, Joseph. And nice to meet you. I know it's always awkward over Zoom when um, we can't be in person. No um, because a lot of my research centers on environmental um, regulation and its relationship to tribal sovereignty. Um, and then, of course, these connections to uh, settler colonial land allotment policy of the past century. Um, I'm actually curious to know more about um, maybe if there's any examples in your own work that you've confronted around these complications of jurisdiction and what um, how maybe that's challenged your work. I noticed you did show some images. Um, you had like you, the rectangular square where you're designating, oh, this is um, like historic property. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I could just leave that really open-ended in terms of like how notions of jurisdiction figure into, into the work that you're doing with indigenous communities. Yeah, I, I, a lot of the times, I mean, that, that, that image specifically, right, uh, is something when we talk about sovereignty, self-determination, what does it mean to be sovereign? What does it mean to be self-determined? And I, a lot of the time, when I was when I arrived at Santa Domingo, uh, I, I was brought into council, and they're like, oh, "Well, you can you can navigate these systems. Go to DC and ask for more money for our housing project." And uh, and I I kind of put my foot down a little bit there uh, to tribal council, and I was wondering if I was going to get like in trouble. But this this idea of like if a tribe kind of wants to be lifting up this notion around sovereignty and self determination. I, I said, if we're go if I'm going to DC to ask for more funds for housing, then this kind of notion of this permanent crutch of continuously relying on the federal government to, to supply dollars for housing, which I, uh, which is in my mind, uh, to be blunt, is like a, a waste of time. And, and so how can we 
uh, be understanding the systems in which we're working in. And so that, that prime example of working with the National Park Service who designated these boxes randomly on tribal lands was all, well, if we wanna really be advocating for what does it mean to kind of define what is historical and what is not, then then you as a community should be defining not, not that, not necessarily, not, not, not an outside entity. And so let's do our work. Let's let's like get out into the community and, and walk around and use the tools that we do, like the kind of and and this is where I kind of it, the kind of Western knowledge and Western ways of, of of practicing come into tension with like indigenous ways of being, uh, which I find to be that's that's where I find it to be interesting. It's, and and I kind of very much lift up this. I acknowledge that my whole education is based in a kind of Eurocentral Western space right my whole educate my our whole architectural and design education but knowing that uh, i've kind of grown up in kind of uh, in in different like indigenous ways i've learned from my my ancestors like how do i start to bring that and, and try and bring these two together in a way that's not quote unquote like this this harmony it's always intention but like when do you lift it up when do you not and in this instance when we were defining what is like what is historic and what is not and that's when I thought we could really do some, do that work justice, uh, if that makes any sense. Can I chime in really quick? I wonder, as someone who has studied the history of those Western modes of, of deciding what's historic and not, what, what methods did you decide? Was it image? Was it some kind of numeric age? Was it sort of, uh, depth of memory was was it practical? It was more practical to include this house or not? I mean, how how did you know? Are there criteria that uh, because one would imagine that the category of historic is itself a kind of Western categorization? No, how yeah. did you decide? Yeah, it's a. I mean, the National Park Service, right? They it's like a point in time in history that some white guy gets to decide like this is historic and this is not like this wood frame structure is historic and that's not well when I, one of my one of our kind of board members uh who who led the office of native american programs within the department of housing and urban development uh he, he's uh, Danae and uh he I, every time like my first meeting with him when i first was introduced to uh for first introduced to into uh, roger uh roger boyd he he kind of points to his ring finger and and he, he points to this ring and he said before this was a navajo ring this was a spanish ring but what makes it navajo is the innovation that kind of made it made it uh made it become a navajo ring which i i found pretty pretty powerful that it, like it's always constantly changing and so the the relationship to the to the land was uh what was important what was crucial there's a kind of a spanish church uh and then there was an acequia or a ditch um and so that that became the boundary that kind of water source became the boundary of what was historic and what was not and then we kind of moved closer to the rio grande to kind of define what was historic and what was not and so i mean yeah it it, it became more the more and more we we sat and, and talked with one another and, and, and sat in community with one another, we started to realize that this wasn't as complex as it needed to be. I, I appreciate um, what, you, what you mentioned and also um, Lucia's provocation around like historic, right? Because I think the double bind is the necessity of tribes having to pander to a certain extent to the system, right? In terms of both like trust designation or these categories of, you know, historic preservation. Um, and, you know, I think that definitely there's critiques within our communities of, oh, we don't want to rely on uh, on federal, federal money. Um, you know, what does it really mean to be self-determined to self-empower? Um, but at the same time, like, to what extent um, do we still need to like incorporate, you know, the, these notions? I mean, like for instance, you know, the Navajo Nation government, you know, it's a three branch system. You know, we've incorporated a lot of um, like forms of Western governance into our own tribal communities. And unfortunately, you know, forms of patriarchy and things that, that we would determine to be very colonial, 
Um, and so a lot of like what I'm seeing is even moving beyond tribal governance itself. And that's also like, I think something that's hard for, for folks on the outside to see is that there's all these internal conversations about like, um, you know, self-determination, um, which is really community-based and community-centered. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of curious, you know, like if, from, your, um, from your work, um, yeah, what sorts of like housing projects or um, things that are trying to redefine indigenous space that um, is, I guess, more community centered and not necessarily under what you would call these federal categories of like historic preservation or HUD or anything. Because I think, I imagine you're doing both of those, right? And you have to strategically navigate um, between federal sort of tribal programs and then like community based programs. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, well, building off of some of the, your work, it's like, where do we go from here with all that knowledge that you're, you're kind of building? It's like, how do we, how do we kind of situate ourselves? But you can't unknow what you know, uh, which is like, incredibly complex in, 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 in that space. And I would say, like navigating HUD policy or, or trying to figure out how to leverage Indian housing block grant funds, what I find to be exciting is that tribes, federally recognized tribes, all, all have a, a guaranteed pool of income or grant dollars, depending on how you want to look at it, that is, uh, that is outlined by Congress every year in the federal budget to build housing, right? That's a, it's like a stepping stone, but that's not going to solve, solve the issue. And this is where, how do we, I mean, this notion of how do we define wealth? How do we think about wealth? And it, it's not necessarily in the monetary sense. And this is where it get, like every community gets to define it on its on their own terms. Uh, but inevitably, it's like how do we build housing? How do we build communities that really reflect our our values? And that's something that uh, we try and work with communities to define. Like that's uh, and so. Uh, in many ways, it's like navigating the systems, like how do we get a family to qualify for uh, a, a mortgage product or like a lending project or, or or you just simply put access debt capital, like which is your traditional home like mortgage. And how, how is that, up, how does that get applied on tribal trust land? Well, right now we have access to a HUD 184 loan, but not many financial institutions actually provide that that mortgage that 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 program uh and so how do we kind of open it up and so this is where it i i, I find it to be intention too it's like well do you want to open up trust land to the kind of general financing system uh do we want to do that in a way that allows uh communities to build wealth in a kind of traditional western way uh yes no some communities have different stances on that and that's not for us to decide it's really for the communities and for tribal leaders to decide how that is allocated and those are like incredibly complex generational conversations um yeah it's no no direct answer but i think it's different in every one of the communities that we're working in i want to ask Teresa about architecture i know it's going to be not what you um sort of where your attention is focused because but i'm thinking of the kind of possible critique that you're that you just mentioned, and possibly that many others, these discussions that are happening of the critique of the very form of governance, and to what extent architecture con conceived pretty traditionally, like a house, would take part in that. So that if you're, you know, advocating for water, you know, running water, basically an architecturally educated person thinks that means house. That means house with foundation that means like a really specific and I noticed in Joseph your your projects the, the one that you showed you know has a very specific water feature which water is a very I mean there's an entire feature of that of that design that that has to do with how water is is brought in but I mean is there a conversation where it, when one advocates radically for water rights that actually doesn't include a house that it includes something else I mean I'm just wondering is that does the architectural scale is is it something that that impedes that occurs to you in any way, especially when dealing with water rights. 
Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, water rights is a huge um, issue in the Southwest, obviously, and it's complicated by, well, one, um, so there's this act, the Winters Doctrine from 1908, which in theory um, provides tribes uh, with the right to water um, from, but it's premised on this idea of from its establishment as a reservation. So already that's limiting, right? Because that is forcing us to conform to a Western temporality. So for, for a Navajo nation, that would mean 1868 because that's when there's, our treaty was signed. Of course, we have lived in the Southwest since time immemorial, like other tribes, you know? So I, I guess I'm always trying to point to how, you know, these, the existing like system of legislation is already confining either temporally, geographically, um, epistemologically, um, but yet this is what we are forced to, to confront. Um, also with water rights, um, at least in uh, the Southwestern states, um, we don't have a, a seat at the table, um, so to speak, in the same way that states do. So for like Western Basin states who all draw from the Colorado River, um, like the Colorado Compact of 1922 basically imagines a pie, right? A water allotment pie. Um, and then each of the, the, the lower basin states and upper basin states would be able to each take a slice. And this you know, is based on population and based on imagined use. Um, well, tribes didn't, didn't, you know, weren't imagined to initially have a, a, a slice of this pie. They would have to go through states. So for right now, you know, the Navajo Nation, you know, we've um, negotiated a settlement through the state of Utah um, with the state of New Mexico. Um, Arizona is still like on the table. Um, in any case, like this is just like one example of the ways that trying to secure water is, is a really fraught like political process. Um, and that's at the scale of like nationhood, right? And in terms of like communities and household, um, that's limited by infrastructure, right? And, um, you know, this like these ideas of, um, you could call like the metropole and the periphery, right? And the metropole being like Phoenix and uh, Los Angeles that um, built all of this infrastructure to deliver water to those cities uh, of higher like population density, which left out tribes. And, um, you know, there's these smaller scale, um, uh, you know, amazing projects that I think Diné communities are doing to deliver to deliver water. Um, but even I think the notion of like infrastructure as development is problematic, right? Um, to thinking about a large scale delivery um, that would draw down our aquifers and deplete it. And that, that's kind of like a notion I think the Navajo Nation as a tribe really wants to invest in because that's, that's, that is the, um, the way that you can get water for an entire nation. Um, but I know, you know, from like a more community or grassroots perspective, it's about like, well, how do we recharge our aquifers and protect our watersheds? It, is it really sensible in an era of um, climate change and drought? We are now, it's now like officially declared we are in this longest drought that we've been in for several hundred years. Um, to be imagining these large scale water projects. Um, but that is, that is kind of the, the system with, with which we have to like subscribe to, to assert our rights to water. Um, so yeah, I think across the board, it's just all of these double binds of like asserting nationhood, which is asserting like a, a large scale sort of project and then asserting, I, I don't know, um, more of a, um, a better balance with our with our communities um, and, and like non-human relatives and like not taking water from them and it's always these competing sort of sorts of logics and yeah I think water is essential to all of those tensions. Yeah, I I mean I have a reaction to that, which is that. Um, Joseph, when we spoke before, you know, the skull when we first met. Um, you mentioned that essentially the federal tools that you're often having to resort to to bring funding require, have over the years, over this history, required tribal structures to be mirrors of the federal government. And that this is basically what, you know, what's 
scholars call the politics of recognition. In order to be recognized, you have to look like the interlocutor with whom you're, who's recognizing you. And so that's one image that one has of that there's a kind of mirror, a false mirror relationship between the states and federal governments and, and, and what uh, is recognized as a structural, a formal tribe. Teresa, in your work, you write about permeability, which is, you know, conjures up the idea of water. And, and, and what's evocative about it, and I encourage everybody to sort of read your writing on it, is that on the one hand, it describes basically Western um, permeation and, and eating away at native lands. Um, on, and on the other hand, it also describes a politics of resistance like you could permeate back or, or permeation is kind of what you have. So I'm just wondering if both of you, and then after this, I'll maybe read some of the Q, or the questions we have in the chat. Both of you can kind of talk about that. And I, re I recognize my questions coming from the outside because I'm asking, about, I'm not asking about models. I'm just thinking how, how useful are these concepts? Because in some ways they're kind of, uh, you know, uh, describing these binds structurally, like the bind of the mirror and the bind of the permeability. I can go first or you can go first. <laughs> go for it. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just speak uh, briefly on um, this notion of permeability. Um, so the notion of permeability, um, I think, can be illustrated by that checkerboard map that I, I showed really briefly, which is that allotment system. Um, you know, and for my family and ancestors in a Perco Valley region, you know. Um, this has continued to have consequences for the exercise of Navajo jurisdiction today is like the vestiges of this allotment system that still exists. Um, so through working with these community coalitions, um, when they realize that the Navajo Nation doesn't have sovereignty over this, you know, these, these communities as they're trying to remediate, um, you know, uranium contamination in their water, um, they were strategically able to navigate in other ways that might have not been available to them if they were only relying on like uh, Navajo Nation EPA or those sorts of uh, tribal regulatory authorities. So it required them working, you know, with Na um, EPA Region 9 in San Francisco, which is the EPA region that oversees uh, the tribes in the Southwest, um, you know, working with Arizona Department of uh, Environmental Quality, or I should say pushing back against um, the state entities. Um, and then also, you know, the Navajo Nation itself. Um, and so I'm trying to imagine, you know, not reifying um, tribal sovereignty so much in just this very um, like st static uh, federal tribal relationship, um, because that could also, that's very limiting. It's, it's the way that enables us to assert our sovereignty and our, our land base, but it's also limiting in terms of it, it's premised upon, um, you know, a shortening of like our, our time scales of occupation in the region, if it's premised on, oh, since the date of our establishment of reservation, um, you know, and as history shows, as our oral histories tell us, like we have occupied these lands um, before the date of our formal like reservation establishment. Um, so I'm trying to also point, gesture to that as other like indigenous scholars do as well. Um, Yes, we are part. We are part of these tribal nations um, that are federally recognized or state recognized or whatever. But there's also something else. There's other sites of sovereignties that pre-exist and continue to exist. Um, and th that's what I'm trying to hold in tension and to articulate and to um, to uphold. Um, and those things are not always visible from the outside, like the way that tribes continue to you know assert this sort of self determination that isn't always. Um, conforming to geopolitical boundaries of what you know, tr tribal nationhood, and um, so yeah, I in that way I think um, Joseph's work is really interesting because I imagine you know you're working through <laughs> all these different sorts of um, entities, and um, you know from an indigenous perspective, it's um, yeah, our occupation in these lands doesn't start at when 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 our reservations were established. It's it's much longer, it's time immemorial. Totally, I, uh, yeah, uh, like some point, again, some random, not some random guy, but an individual basically said that at this point in time, 
this band needs to identify as Cheyenne, right? And meanwhile, like when you go to, when you hear our stories, uh, it's like, oh yeah, well, your great, great grandfather was actually part of this Sioux band or that, like, so there's these connections that we're not necessarily recognizing in, from a Western sense. The kind of, this idea of like, like tribal nations is an interesting one, right? We, as a, a, a my tribe, the Northern Cheyenne, we ousted our tribal president two weeks ago, right? And and those and and it's not that, um, and so it doesn't necessarily work very well. I'd say in, in in a kind of Cheyenne perspective, right? Our our traditional, our we have a traditional government and we have a Western government, and they don't necessarily work very well together. And and that could be looked at at from an outside perspective, from a Western. Oh, those they don't know how to run their government. Well, it's this like false dichotomy that you you're trying to impose a structure that just doesn't work with how our community runs whereas or our community operates right we we, we operate in different types of bands and and our kind of government structures rely on different types of societies and that's how it's historically worked and in, in, in the past 140 years it hasn't worked like that um, uh, because of this imposing but some tribes do work very well under these systems right I, I, lifting up like uh shakopee or ho-chunk or or uh, cherokee nation like and their their abilities to kind of serve not only their populations but other both tribal populations and non-native populations so you look at cherokee nation where they're one of the largest provide health systems provider in in the state of oklahoma right they're serving natives and non-natives they're and they're able to kind of operate within the system incredibly well. So it's, you, there's not, you can't qualify indigenous people as like one people, right? Uh, and, and that's where I think we go awry. And that's where from an outsider perspective, it's hard to kind of understand the nuances in, in every one of these communities. Yeah, I mean, that the, those are thoughts in, trying to kind of arrange this blind date <laughs> of an event where it's really important to think of cultural production and knowledge production as being one way that, that people from very different uh, you know, daily practices can still have the conversation. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you've sort of um, agreed to sort of talk. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of questions from uh, the Q&A. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, would either of you be willing to share your views on the role of the Navajo Housing Authority, part of the Navajo Nation government that manages public housing for the tribe in addressing the housing situation of the Navajo Nation? Um, and um, I'll just, I mean, I'll just, you know, because it seems relevant to what you were just discussing, that the fact that there is even such a thing as a housing authority, that, that word is like, that's not an American construction. I don't know American in the in the traditional sense. Um, so yeah, the fact that there is a housing authority and and how does that? Do you have views on that that you're willing to share? Actually, I'm. Reese, I, 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 say. Yeah, I, mean, I can, I feel I can like go first or either I'll, one. You might have more working experience with NHK versus me. Yeah. I have maybe anecdotal <laughs> like experience with it. Yeah, I mean, and it would be great to hear your thoughts. I mean, I just think you're setting up an institution for failure. Uh, and, and, and from my perspective, you, you, you have incredible amounts, multi-millions of dollars going to one entity. And then you're asking this entity to service many different communities in different ways. And that, that system is not set up. And when you don't have that internal capacity to get the money out into the communities, when you don't physically have both the people and or the systems, financial systems, accounting systems uh, in, in order, it, it's really hard to get that money out into the community. When you don't have uh, the ability to kind of have project managers, like it's, you're, you're, you're set up for failure. And then in, in the kind of reverse side, you have the community trying to kind of say, why are you not serving our communities? Why are you not serving our communities? Uh, and it's it's like hand tying. And we see this in, in, in terms of allocating of federal funds all over the country. Like the capacity is just not there within these, within these entities. Um, I um, 
love to hear what you, your thoughts, Teresa. Teresa, do you, do you want to I mean, add? I'll just, oh yeah, I'll just briefly say, I mean, there's just, like in my experience, like there's just such a vast shortage of housing. And, and even with the houses that are available, like with upkeep and are these houses even built well to begin with um, is a whole nother thing. I mean, I think tangentially related to this is now with this um, infusion of cash uh, with, for, for infrastructure now with the CARES Act. Um, so the Navajo Nation now is also scrambling to like, how do we spend it on all these dollars? How can we build up infrastructure, which is also about housing improvements, right? So for many folks who don't have running water or bathrooms, so I know like families that were able to like apply for and then get funding like through their local chapters. So then each chapter is like allocated a certain amount of money. And um, but yeah, but the, the, the challenge is, yeah, not having like the capacity to like deliver. It's like, yes, we need to um, build and to provide water or, you know, any sort of like housing infrastructure. Um, but it, you're talking about a reservation that's 27,000 square miles. It's the state the size of West Virginia. It exists across three different states. Um, so putting that into practice of, you know, a building is, is a challenge. That's, so what's interesting is that the role that infrastructure plays is so primary, um, not only to governance, but to, Decision making, it seems. Um, so this feeds into another question we have, which is from uh, someone called Riz Getz, who says, "I'm curious to hear more about both of your thoughts on the first slides by Joseph. How does the urban-rural divide that privileges urban areas and life and disadvantages rural communities add another, perhaps often hidden, dimension of disinvestment and erasure in many indigenous communities? So the kind of rural versus urban um, divide." Yeah, and I'd say in many ways, it's a kind of false dichotomy. It's, I mean, if we think about Indian country and, and we think about native population per, not this most recent census, the one before, half of Native Americans live in and or around urban areas, right? And then the other half are on typically reservation. And so it's like this, uh, I, I don't think we should be thinking about it as uh, this kind of rural and, and urban population, but how are we kind of living in between these, these spaces? And I think what is important to lift up is that I'm, well, I'm trained as an urban designer. I'm trained as a, a planner, right? And, and this notion, when I think about like our, our TP encampments, our villages, like those are urban forms. And, and so how do we kind of leverage them in ways in which we can be lifting up communities, right? I, I don't wanna kind of create this, this tension between the urban and the rural, or we're only working in the rural, but we're only working in the urban. I think we're working in all these areas and, and in, the, in between. Um, and so how do we kind of lift that up in a way that is uh, lifting up both sides? I don't know if that, that's helpful or trying to get to your question. Teresa, did you want to add? Um, um, I, I mean, I was just going to say something similar to the effect of, yeah, a lot of our, um, a lot of um, indigenous folks actually live in urban areas. So the, the presumption that you're only dealing with reservation areas is already um, like <laughs> not, not an informed view, um, right. but yeah. But then how do you provide any sorts of services for, for folks on the reservation while also, you know, thinking about the many indigenous people that live um, in cities, you know, especially like Chicago, you know, Denver, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you know, these were relocation cities, right? So that's pointing back to those relocation right. policies by the US government is now you have these urban centers that have significant um, in urban indigenous populations. Yeah, I mean, I, there's the, you know, the pres in architectural discourse, the one presence of um, indigenous, let's say, know-how that makes it to conventional histories of modern architecture are steel workers who, whose history in architectural history is typically told, you know, really through the most basic kind of heroics that they are heroes because they participated in the building of, you know, tall skyscrapers. Uh, but of course, indigenous scholars, including, you know, our colleague, Audra Simpson has shown that 
what is really the site of struggle is, is the, the going back and forth across uh, what the West understands as being national borders and what they themselves understand as not being a national border. Um, and so, um, I mean, I remember reading that book and being having my understanding of steel being completely transformed, that the, the hardness of steel was nothing compared to the hardness of that, you know, weekly or biweekly travel on a bus at night to, in order to be able to go across a border. So um, in a way, what you're discussing, um, Joseph, about the ability to redefine what the urban is, like the, the projects you describe them as urban projects. And that's what HUD stands for. HUD is, you know, housing and urban development. Um, I think that that kind of redefinition could, you know, could use to happen a lot more. Um, so, uh, all right, we have very little time left. I'll just read the last question we have. And uh, since it's a question about a very technical thing, uh, you know, feel free to transition into a broader uh, <laughs> comment. How does the NHPA section 106 process help? Has this EO help, which is a level of engagement and assistance all tied to political administration? And I guess this person is referring to uh, the White House Council on Native and American Affairs, uh, a, a document from- the National Historic Preservation Act. Is it the National Historic Preservation Act? Is that what it is? Yeah, section 106 process. Yeah, the government to government relationship between the two. Yeah, so do you have any comments on that? Is that I mean, the question is whether it's helpful. Maybe you can just comment on its appearance and its. Uh, I'll just kind of, I mean, from my perspective, it, again, it depends on the capacity of a tribe to actually participate in the Section 106 process, right? Do they have a tribal historic preservation office? Do they have the internal capacity to actually be at the table? Uh, I mean, this, this is very similar to litigation when it comes to tribal law, right? Do you have the ability to practice a certain type of law internally right. and if you don't then you have to rely on the federal government to provide that support and so it is just it's it's very dependent a lot of a lot of the larger tribes the tribes that have the ability to kind of have these complex systems to it's kind of that that mirrored system uh they have the ability to kind of show up and show up strong other tribes that don't it, it's sometimes hard i mean i i reckon back to what, what uh when you think about standing rock uh and and dapple Right, the ability to kind of show up during the 106 process, the ability to kind of be there and be present, and what is your obligation as a tribe to be there to kind of confront the federal government or or participate or be in conversation with the federal government is is not necessarily very easy. I mean, as you're running, you're running a community, you're 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 leading a community, and so this is like a larger capacity conversation of and what is what are the obligations of 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 a tribe internally and externally and what are the tri what are the obligations of the federal government to ensure that those systems are there so you can actually participate I don't know um, That's I'm not going to speak specifically to this process I'm not um, um, as familiar with it um, but I will say maybe in this this larger context I mean if we're pushing back against this notion of property right and of like um, Indigenous peoples and tribes, you know, having to toe the line between conforming to like whatever existing legislation is available to them to protect certain things. So it's like a property is like a thing, a structure, right? Um, and, for, you know, for Indigenous people who've like lived and occupied and like moved around areas, you know, like this, this larger conversation of sacred lands, I think is instructive here. So I'll just point to, you know, what, what um, happened at Bears Ears um, and the intertribal coalition that was formed to protect um, a region of sacred lands, right? Um, so maybe akin to this notion of like historic preservation, right? But it's for an entire landscape and having to use and leverage uh, existing US um, um, uh, frameworks to protect that. Um, so short of, you know, like all these conversations around land back, right? Like they can't um, get back this land into like their own trust management, but the tribes work together using the Antiquities Act of 1906 to petition um, the former Obama administration to establish a national monument for, to protect Bears Ears. Um, so that's just like, I think a tangential, but maybe like mm -hmm. an illustration of how like tribes are using and strategizing to like, how can we protect our landscapes or our properties or things of cultural patrimony mm -hmm. um, and working together. I mean, I think that was that was historic, right? Um, tribes that maybe historically hadn't always gotten along, but were like, hey, we we share this sacred landscape and we want to protect it from resource extraction, 
Um, so yeah, I would just kind of point point yeah. people to also <laughs> that that legislation. There's years. Yeah, it's a wonderful. Thing. I mean, on that note of sort of hopeful solidarity, um, one thing to note is that in in the history of preservation movements, the United States and especially this ability and the various years episode in particular has been noted worldwide by other you know, disenfranchised communities who have noticed that you can use nature preservation to act at a very broad scale um, and to use, you know, and, and I'm talking about sort of Southern Europe and also, but also, you know, in Southeast Asia, a, an apparently very weak kind of claim, which is a cultural claim for a territory can actually be very strong, especially against, you know, blatantly predatory um, sort of infrastructural and resource extractive re regime. So, um, well, if we can maybe end on that slightly, um, that sort of bell of solidarity, maybe. Um, I want to uh, truly thank Joseph and Teresa for having joined us and thank you to the to the audience also. It's uh, really too bad that we couldn't um, be together in person. Um, and for the rest of the spring, we will have two more events. One is called On Counting Land and the other is called uh, Making the Land Pay. Um, so I invite you all to join us again. And um, thank you again, Joseph and Teresa. I will uh, uh, encourage everybody to keep following your work. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you all. Again.